turn in your Bibles to the book of James chapter 1 as we continue our journey through the Bible. James chapter 1. And we'll be looking at verse 17 through 25. Um, and the title of this message is Applying the Word of God to Our Lives. Applying the Word of God to Our Lives. As we'll see in today's passage, um, James is going to deal with the believer's relationship to the Word of God. And as you know, we live in a world that is biblically illiterate. While we might expect such ignorance uh, from the world, we must not expect or accept it among God's people. But as we, and it seems that there's so many professing Christians that are just as ignorant concerning God's word as the world. God's people need to be people of the word, of the Bible. So we must learn it, we must love it, and live it out. That's the bottom line. And there's no other book in the world will do that for us, quite like what the Word of God does for us. So let's read our passage, and then we'll get into the study. Uh, we'll start actually in verse 16, and then we'll go through uh, verse 25. So it's, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of his truth, that we might be the kinds of firstfruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let everyone be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks to the perfect law of liberty and continues in it is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. And let's pray. Father, as we study your word, that you would speak to each and every one of us. We want to be doers of your word. We want to apply these things. And sometimes it's our pride that gets in the way that hinders us from wanting to apply and to uh, do these things that you tell us to do, to be obedient. So I pray, Lord, that we'd have that receptive heart to uh, hear your word, but also doing your word. I pray you bless this time as we study. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, to recap a little bit from last week and to add a little bit more depth uh, on the issue of dealing with temptation, uh, as we all know, we all get tempted. Uh, it's not a sin to be tempted, as we pointed out last week, but uh, when you give in to them and, and to the de deceptions of our heart and to the desires, then it leads us into sin. And so when it comes to temptation, there are so many variables, uh, versions, combinations, that no list can really uh, contain them all. Uh, and James simply tells us that we, we are all tempted when we're drawn away by our own desires and enticed. Now, giving in to our desires only strengthens them. Uh, and this is positive news if the desires are good and holy and right, Correct? So, not all temptation has to be bad. So, these can be good things. And one of the ways that we grow in the grace of God is by doing the, the right things, the good things. But if our desires are wrong and out of whack, our distorted desires takes greater and greater control of our lives, and we fall further and further into sin. Now, as we mentioned last time, again, we talked about some of the main categories that you can place temptations in, from spiritual temptations, mental, emotional, uh, verbal, physical, financial, and ego, and the top of the ego list is pride. That's the bottom line, that's the root of all sin, it's pride. Uh, but like we said, there's so many areas, so many types and categories of temptation, and as you say over and over again, we all have issues, we all have um, areas that we need to work on and to deal with. There's not one person here, not one person listening, that doesn't have an issue or problem that they need to sort through and work through. So how do we deal with temptation? There's a couple helpful tips uh, to consider. Number one is to flee temptation, right? Uh, we're reminded in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, where it says, uh, Flee youthful lust, pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. 
Now, the, the youthful lust that's mentioned there is not necessarily referring to physical appetites, but it's also a lust for fame, pleasure, money, etc. It's self-willed, it's impatience, it's pride, it's sensuality, etc. So there's a lot that goes under that. And Timothy, by the way, whom Paul was writing to, he's probably in his mid-30s or so. Uh, so this youthful lust that he's addressing here doesn't necessarily or mean uh, that would be particularly characteristic of a teenager, because we always think of youthful as a teenage adolescent uh, word, but it's not. But this includes all unholy desires that would prevent themselves, uh, especially of a young servant of the Lord uh, that's seeking to divert them from the path of purity and righteousness. And so Timothy is exhorted to flee that stuff, but to pursue, to follow, uh, pursue righteousness. Notice that. Uh, so this simply means the dealings with others should always be characterized by this honesty, this justice, and, and doing what is fair and right. And, and how many times do we see in Paul's letters uh, place the, the words faith and love and uh, peace, because uh, that really sums up the Christian life. And so these qualities are normal uh, for those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So again, flee youthful lust, flee temptation. Uh, the second step in dealing with temptation is to resist temptation. We're reminded, and we'll see this later on in chapter 4, verse 7, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And by the way, the word resist there, it's a military metaphor urging Christians to stand our ground against the temptations or satanic attacks. So we resist the devil when we refuse to surrender to the impulse of our desires or sins. So we resist that. We're also reminded, and we covered this back in uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, where it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And it tells us to resist him. You know, steadfast in the faith, knowing the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So if we're to resist the, um, the temptation, the devil, effectively, we must draw on the power of Christ and not yield to the temptations or uh, Satan's you know, direction in our lives. Also to resist the devil, the believer must stand firm in their faith. Uh, so we need to draw strength on what we believe. Everything that pertains to life and godliness is in the word of God. And one of Satan's devices and strategies and tools is to discourage us along the way, to get us not to flee or to resist uh, temptation. He wants to hinder us uh, in resisting temptation. He wants to stumble us and encourage us to sin and um, to, to do those sort of things. And the other part of the, the, the discouragement that goes along with that is he can get us to be discontent and to be critical. So all those sort of come along together. It starts with being discouraged, and that can lead to all these other um, areas and attitudes in our life. And, and when you're having these attitudes and this um, mindset, you're open game for the temptation. You're open game for Satan's attacks and schemes and plans. So we need to take these attitudes to deal with them. Um, you know, surrender it, work through it, so that temptation or Satan doesn't get a foothold or stronghold in your life. You know, so you don't, uh, um, you know, go in that downward spiral or for Satan to take you out. You know, and you see where people have given in to all these sort of things, and you can see it in their attitudes, and you see it in their countenance. Anyways, we're to resist temptation. The next step in dealing with temptation is to endure temptation. We saw that in verse 12 last week. And you know, the hardest part about fighting these temptations is so often we don't feel like we want to escape it in that moment. That's where that, that, that struggle, that wrestling match takes place. We, we want to give in to it, but yet we know we shouldn't. So that wrestling match in that moment to escape. So enduring, persevering, keep pressing through the temptation, uh, meaning not giving in to it, but taking those thoughts captive walking out or turning it off or whatever uh, situation that we're facing, saying no to it and saying yes to the Lord and doing what is right. You can overcome temptation. And again, don't put yourself in a vulnerable situation. And that leads us to another step in dealing with temptation, and that is to pray to escape temptation. 
there's always a way to escape uh, out of the temptation, out of the situation. So we need wisdom, we need grace, and we need strength to say no and to remove ourselves or turn it off or not give in to the desires of the flesh uh, when it's contrary to the Word of God and to the Lord, uh, to holiness. So those are things that we can do, and this is what we could be praying for one another. So flee, resist. Endure, pray to escape temptation. It's all there for us. It's easy to see, but we got to do it. And sin, as you know, is a very serious matter uh, and, and must not be allowed to reign in our lives. And again, one of the best chapters to read, and we'll talk a little bit this uh, tonight in Romans chapter 6. You know, it's one of the best chapters in dealing and overcoming sin in our life. And again, don't be deceived into thinking that you can handle temptation or sin. Uh, don't be deceived into blaming God for temptation, as we saw last week. But take ownership and take responsibility for what you're doing. And that leads us to this next set of verses where we see God's goodness stands in contrast to the temptations that we face. Notice verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is come from above and comes down from the Father of lights, where there is no variation or shadow of turning. Now, one of the keys to keeping ourselves from falling into temptation or into sin is to maintain a close relationship with the Lord, a close walk with Him, you know, and, and the application of His Word in our daily lives. That is full proof. We'll still you know, mess up because we're still human, we're still in our fleshly nature. Until we're in glory, we're not going to have that problem. But this is one of the best ways for us to be sensitive to the Lord and to what He wants for us. This pattern will lead us to see perfectly every good and every perfect gift from above. The Greek text here, by the way, these two separate words describing God's giving. The first word talks about the act of giving, and it's accompanied by that adjective good there. The second indicates the actual gifts uh, received, uh, preceded by the adjective perfect. So good and perfect uh, is describing how God gives and what he gives. So the first expression really emphasizes the goodness of receiving something from God. The second is the perfect quality of whatever God gives us. So God is giving uh, is continuously good. Everything that he does is good. Okay? His gifts are always perfect as well. So they are given at the right time and also for the good purpose. So always keep that in mind. This can also result in God withholding a good gift from us that would not be perfect from us. Even though it is a good thing, but it's not perfect for us. It might be perfect for someone else. So just because someone else got the gift that you might want, don't be jealous and don't be envious. I know it's hard for us and our flesh and our pride to do that. But again, God is always good and he's always perfect in what he does and what he gives. And so this truth, again, should help us rejoice with us when they receive good gifts from the Lord, uh, even though we have not received the same ones. So we can be assured that God always wills what is best for us. Uh, not good things today and bad things tomorrow. He's always going to give what is good and what is perfect. Uh, whatever happens for us is for our best interest. God's gifts are very good. They're also, it fits us perfectly. So keep that in mind. Also, by the way, we can never earn or deserve God's gifts or blessings or anything from the Lord. Okay? So God is a giving God regardless of who we are or what we do. So that takes the pressure off of us of trying to perform or try to work our way for blessing or for God's favor uh, to bless us. It doesn't work that way. He'll, he'll do it regardless of who you are or what you do or don't do. Uh, so it's not a workspace or performance-based relationship. It's an acceptance-based relationship, and that will change everything once you get that concept. And notice it comes down from the Father of light. So this phrase really pictures God as the sovereign creator of the universe. So the, the giving character of God is written in his creation. Uh, again, as the Bible says in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim uh, the work of his hands. So God gives us good gifts and the light by which to see and to enjoy them. 
Another character that we see within this passage that he doesn't change, like the, the shifting shadows. The, the shadows, as you know, when the sun uh, goes from one point to another, the shadow changes. But not so with the Lord. You know, he's a, he, he, that's one of his characteristics. He cannot change. Um, so God's character is always trustworthy. It's reliable. It's faithful. Um, nothing can block God's goodness from reaching us. Uh, so it's healthy, again, for us to even have a humble and thankful attitude and gratefulness to the Lord for his unchanging love for us. We can praise him, thank him for your faithfulness, Lord, that uh, you're always consistent. And, uh, and, and again, that last phrase, there, uh, no variableness or shadow of turning. And this is kind of where I picture in my mind who are James uh, had to pause and worship the Lord here uh, as he penned these words, realizing that the God he served did not change. He's always faithful. You can count on him. He is a good God. He is a gracious God. He's a loving God. No variable this, no shadow of turning. So God doesn't change, so we can count on him to be consistent with himself. He doesn't change. Uh, and that's a wonder because people change, right? So, but this is the thing, and James had never experienced a time when God was unable or unwilling to meet his need. Verse 18 goes on to say, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that he might bring the kinds of first fruits of his creatures. So we can see the goodness of God in our salvation. Uh, so he initiated salvation for us. He called us. We responded. Uh, so it's of his own will. He brought us forth the spiritual life by the word of truth that we might be uh, to him the glory of his first fruits of his harvest. So notice the characteristics here. So it is a work of God. So when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, it was God who performed the miracle. So again, it always comes back to the Lord. Nothing that we can do. Uh, we didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. God gave us spiritual birth because of his own grace and his will. So no one can be born again because of being in the family or relatives or um, because of self or religion or church or anything like that. New birth is a work of God, period. Everyone, by the way, is a candidate of salvation. That's the good news. The good news is that all people can be saved. But it is absolutely necessary for an individual to exercise their will to trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior if they are going to be saved. And although God wants everyone to be saved, no one is saved unless they recognize their need and trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, the Bible says, shall be saved. It's not rocket science, it's not hard. You know, just whoever is willing to believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And notice it was through God's word. So just as human birth requires two parents, if you will, divine birth requires two parents. And I'm not thinking there's two parents in the uh, sense that we're thinking, but the word of God and the spirit of God. It's, it's, it's those working together. The Bible says in John 3, 6, uh, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. We also saw in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible by the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. So the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to bring about this miracle of new birth into our lives. And since the Word of God is living and powerful, it can generate that life within us where we're born again uh, in the heart of the, the sinner that trusts in Christ. So James calls the Word of God the engrafted Word or uh, the implanted Word. So it depends on your translation, same idea. Now, if you remember the parable that Jesus gives in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, I'll share the same parable of the sower. Uh, he compares the Word of God to seed and the human heart to soil. So within these, uh, he describes the, the hearts of people, four different kinds. There's the hard and unresponsive uh, heart. So this is the, the seed that fell by the wayside. So they didn't understand, they didn't receive the word. It was hard ground. Uh, the shallow heart uh, or re impulsive heart. So this person receives it with joy, but then soon the trials or temptation or persecution hits and they fall by the wayside. They're emotional, but they have no depth and bore no fruit as well. And then there's the thorny ground or the crowded heart, which again represents kind of a divided or crowded uh, worldly heart. The thorns, as it says, eventually choked out the word. 
uh, the distractions, the cares of this life choke out the word. And the common thing among those first three types of soil is that none of them bear fruit. Uh, some look promising for a while, but the, in the end, nothing happens to it. And then the fourth one is the good soil, the response of the fruitful heart, uh, which they receive the word, uh, they allow it to take root and produce a harvest or fruit. So if the word of God is given new life through, uh, you know, if God has given new life through his word, then we must prepare our hearts to receive and have that receptiveness to his word. Now, believers, as it mentions here, are first fruits because we are part of the new creation in Christ. No longer sin or separated from God, but God's own children. So the rest of all that he created must wait for God's plan to unfold, the redemption that will happen. And Romans chapter 12 does talk about this, how creation groans uh, for the creator. Uh, but those who have been given spiritual birth have been welcomed uh, by the first fruit, which is Christ, into the kingdom of God and are part of the new creation that he has established. So our life, uh, to be the kind of first fruits to God out of all his creation, uh, only man can have that intimate, interactive relationship with the Lord uh, as an adoptive child with all the inheritance rights as possible. So out of all his creation, we have that unique relationship with the Lord where animals and plant life do, does not have. So a test of salvation is fruit. It's that changed life. Uh, a, a Christian's character and their conduct and ministry to others for the glory of God. Fruit might also be within winning souls and uh, growing in holy living, uh, spiritual character, good works, praise in the Lord. So religious works might be manufactured, but they don't have life in them, nor do they bring glory to God. And we'll talk about uh, religious uh, things next week as it talks about what is true religion. Uh, in the final verses of this chapter. Uh, real fruit has the, the seed for more fruit. Uh, so they, the harvest can continue to grow. Uh, so more fruit and uh, much fruit, as John 15 talks about, as we abide in Christ. But the word of God cannot work in our lives unless we receive it in the right way. That's going to be the key factor there, unless we receive it in the right way. Jesus tells us in the Gospels, take heed to what you hear. But he also says in Luke 8, verse 18, take heed to how you hear as well. Too many people will attend Bible studies or church services, but they never seem to grow because of the receptivity or lack of it in their heart or lack of applying the word in their lives. So is it the fault of the teacher or the pastor or the preacher? Perhaps. But perhaps it's also the fault of the hearer as well. It is possible to be dull of hearing, as Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 states, because of the decay of a spiritual life. When people are hardened and dull of hearing, they're not going to be receptive. They're not going to grow. So as we see here in verse 18, salvation is a matter of God imparting new life through the word of truth. So the Christian will not only experience regeneration of their soul at salvation, but also complete regeneration of their body, soul, and spirit at the entrance into the kingdom of God. Now, starting in verse 19 through 21, we come to another section, another uh, movement within this chapter. Uh, as you know, the first um, section really dealt with Christian, how they cope with trials. And then <clears throat> the second is how they cope with temptation. And then here in verse 19 through 21 is how they connect with the word. So verse 19 says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So, in the light of the nature of temptation and the goodness of God, we must take special care uh, to be slow to anger, slow to wrath, because wrath does not accomplish the righteousness of God. Our wrath almost always simply defends our own pride and our own agenda. The word wrath here uh, in our verse simply means a subtle anger, that abides in the mind sometimes with the idea of getting revenge against someone. So, as we see here in verse 19, it starts out, um, So then, and, and basically James is saying, take note of this, uh, which indicates an important following statement. 
so it has the same effect when we say listen uh, before uh, saying something so we don't want people to miss what we're saying. So James says here, my beloved brethren. So it's that phrase again, we see it over and over. So he communicates his love uh, to his readers. And then it's followed by this threefold instruction. Uh, He's not afraid to instruct those in whom he loves. You see, true love carries a commitment to care for others. So this is especially true when we teach the word. We must tell others the truth about themselves according to the word. It's not my opinion. This is what the word says. And that always needs to be our standard uh, when caring for others. So it says, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. So we can be slow to wrath or learn to be by first learning to be swift to hear, quick to hear, and slow to speak. So much of our anger and wrath comes from being self-centered rather than other-centered. So slow to hear, slow to speak is a way to be other-centered, though. Uh, It's a beautiful way of capturing the idea of active listening. So we're not simply to refrain from speaking, uh, we are to be ready and willingly to listen. Quick to hear implies a readiness to obey what we hear, especially when it comes to the word. So often we do find attitude among believers that the speaker is entirely responsible for getting people to listen uh, by being entertaining, by being relevant or engaging, which is not a bad thing to do. You know, you want to, you know, have that. But we can see this, there's this facade that happens in so many churches. It's all about entertainment. It's all about, you know, fluffiness. Uh, There's no substance there. It's all trying to be uh, relevant and likable. But here James is more or less shifting the responsibility back to the audience. So this quick uh, or swift to hear or listening obviously is to be done with discernment. Uh, We are to check out what we hear according to God's word. And as we say, you never trust a man behind the pulpit without a Bible in your hands. But you need to know what the word says so you can discern what you're hearing and listening to. Uh, and, And again, we need to check out what we hear through the word. If we don't listen both carefully and quickly, we are prone to be uh, misled and to misinformation or uh, false doctrine or error or or all kinds of things that can go in that direction uh, if we're just going to take whatever someone says without testing it through the word. Secondly, we are to be slow to speak. So quick to listen, slow to speak should be kind of taken together, kind of like two sides of a coin. Uh, Slowness in speaking means speaking with humility and patience, not with hasty words or nonstop talking. So constant talking keeps a person from being able to hear. Wisdom, listen, is not always having to say something. Uh, or having something to say. It involves listening carefully, considering prayerfully, and speaking quietly. So we need to take note of how Jesus mixed these up together. Uh, Speaking tends to be marked by uh, the the, uh, concise words that he had. He didn't continue to ramble on. Uh, He asked questions, and he listened. Very important for us to learn. And I'm sure you know this, but our words have a tremendous weight to it, an impact uh, upon uh, those who hear us. Uh, When used appropriately, our words can encourage people, help people, teach people, uh, heal, uh, you know, in reconciliation. Um, On the other hand, words can also confuse and embarrass and hurt and wound people. Many of us grew up with that saying, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. It's not true. If we were to take a poll today, uh, people who got over their physical pains, uh, most of us would say, yes, we got over those physical hurts and wounds. But many have never recovered uh, or fully recovered from the hurtful words or names or labels that have been placed on them. Physical wounds do heal as evidence from the scars or maybe the limp that we have. But verbal wounds infuse, um, you know, sometimes they refuse to close. Uh, it continues to fester there. It's still bruised. It's still, you know, bleeding, uh, oozing pain, keeping us tender and vulnerable. That's what verbal wounds do. Uh, so we've got to be kind to one another instead of putting people down. We must be constantly aware of our words can carry impact. And so they affect everyone around us, our children, our spouse, our neighbors, our friends, our classmates, our coworkers, or whoever. It has a tremendous impact. 
And this is why Jesus tells us uh, to, uh, to, and holds us accountability, every careless word is going to be judged. You know, so, so be careful uh, what you say and also what you're listening to as well. So controlling the words that come out of your mouth is a huge challenge for all of us. Uh, for one thing, again, the stresses of everyday encounter sometimes gets the better of us. The frustration, the anger, we sometimes can easily lash out. It's not right to do. We can easily blame it and make excuses. Um, and sometimes we quickly say things we don't mean. And uh, most of us, again, are exposed to those negative patterns of speech on a daily basis. You're around it all the time in the workplace. You know, every other word is a, a cuss word or whatever. You know, the huge problem is such verbal habits are highly contagious as well. So we've got to be careful what we're listening to. Uh, unfortunately, our tongues often recycle uh, the input from what we hear and our destructive words that come out of our mouths before we know it. And uh, we're going to deal a lot more uh, on the tongue when we get into chapter 3. So something to look forward to. <laughs> so we are to be slow to anger. So anger really closes our minds to God's truth. So this anger erupts when our egos are often bruised, uh, where I'm hurt or uh, my opinions didn't get you know, hurt or I didn't get what I wanted or whatever. Um, and it's just the kind of anger that arises too much from fast talking, not quick listening as well. So, or getting proper perspective of things. You know, before we jump on something, hey, just take a step back. You know, you know, there's two sides to every story, or maybe you know, you get the whole story before you you jump to conclusion or judgment. And so, when injustice or sin occur, we should become angry because others are being hurt. You know, and it's that righteous anger, not a, an ungodly, unhealthy anger. Uh, we shouldn't become angry when we, you know, fail an argument or fall, you know, you know, we didn't get our way uh, or we get neglected or offended. You know, selfish anger never helps anybody. So James warns us a, a, against getting angry at God's word because it just reveals uh, our sins to us. So don't get angry at the word of God because it's here's a mirror. Here's what the, the truth is. Here's our standard. You know, it hurts us at first, hey, you're a sinner, you did this or whatever. You know, it's easy for us to get offended, but it's God's word. And like looking at a mirror, um, you know, you know, uh, it, or like the individual that broke the mirror because they didn't like the image on it. Uh, people rebel against God's word because it tells them the truth about their, their, their desires or their own sinfulness. And that's why a lot of people don't like to read the word because it offends them, you know, convicts them. But it's all a matter of having the right attitude. Attitude, as you know, is a choice. Primarily how we choose to look at life as well. So having the right perspective, you can be a part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And if you think about it, it's kind of like all of us carry two buckets at all times. One bucket is filled with water. Uh, and the other bucket is filled with petrol or gasoline, whatever term you want to use. And every time we come upon a fire, if you will, a problem, an issue, we have a choice. Do you either throw water over that or and put it out, or do you throw a bucket of gasoline or petrol on it uh, on the fire and make it worse? The choice is yours. You know, what are you going to do about it? You know, so are you going to add more fuel to the fire and cause more issues, more damage, or are you going to put water on it and soothe it out or to try to... Uh, deal with the situation properly. Verse 20 uh, goes on to say, For the wrath does not produce uh, uh, the righteousness of God. The word wrath here, again, it's the same word in the previous uh, verse. Uh, it's a word for smoldering anger, uh, like holding grudges against someone. Uh, I know that might uh, you know, shock some people, but this is the way it is. When there's unforgiveness and bitterness and people are holding on to grudges, it's that wrath. That it's talking about here. The anger spoken uh, here is the thoughtless, uncontrolled temper that leads to rash, hurtful words. Uh, and that includes, uh, you know, slander, gossip, sowing discord, uh, you know, defaming someone's character or putting a, a, someone down or whatnot. So listen, our anger towards others does not create life within us uh, that can stand God's scrutiny. So again, God's word is the final authority. Anger is inconsistent with God's command to love our enemies and to uh, not hate our brothers, as uh, Matthew chapter 5 talks about. Anger usurps God's role as judge. You're trying to take matters into your own hands instead of letting God deal with that situation or that person. In fact, we can be sure that our anger is wrong when it keeps us from living as God wants us to live. 
So how do we obtain a righteous life that God desires? Well, if we were to ask this question to James at this point in this letter, James would, would simply take us right back to the beginning of the letter. The righteous life that God you know, desires avoids anger, but actively pursues that life that is tested, that, that faith that is tested. Endurance, maturity, perfection, contentment, spiritual growth and birth, uh, quick listening, obeying the word. All those sort of things all come together. You see, knowing the places and the, the ways that we are tempted uh, helps us prepare to how to pray. Uh, and by planning alternative responses instead of giving in to anger or uh, that temptation. When we're misunderstood, ignored, unloved, criticized, unnoticed, overlooked, unappreciated, insulted, overworked, harassed, left out, disappointed, hurt, and the list goes on. Uh, So we need to surrender every part, every issue, every person, every circumstance and situation over to the Lord. When we do that, we can start to see and have uh, a fresh perspective and deal with things in a proper way. Now, verse 21 goes on to say, Therefore lay aside all filthiness, overflow of wickedness, receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So this carries the idea of the impure manner of living. Uh, So in the light of the the nature of temptation and the goodness of God, we are to lay aside all impurities, uh, putting them far from us as possible. So we're to get rid of all uh, moral filth and evil that is so prevalent in our life, uh, even before we came to Christ, but also some of that stuff still lingers on many years afterwards. And according to the Greek here, it would be more of a a once-for-all action. So why should we do this? Well, The progression in our spiritual life cannot occur unless we see sin for what it is. We need to quit justifying it and decide to get rid of it and to quit. So James' word picture here is um, us getting rid of these evil habits and thoughts and actions by stripping off the old clothes, if you will. And the Bible tells us to put off and put on. You see this in great length in Ephesians chapter 4 and also Colossians chapter 3. It gives you actually a list of things to put off and put on. The most important thing to do is you focus on putting on. The putting off, you know, uh, takes care of itself. The put-offs, in order to put off the old sinful habits, you got to identify them, examining them, judging them uh, in your life in the light of God's Word. That's what we look at. So it's not our opinion and trying to justify it. Once you have specifically identified sins in your life, you repent of it, you confess them, and immediately you put them aside. Now, to put on, as you put on righteous deeds by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will glorify the Lord, you will also demonstrate your love for Him, and you will please Him in all things. So that's the putting on part. Um... So in order to to change your thoughts, your words, and actions uh, while following Christ, you must learn to uh, and obey God's word. So his word lists so many transgressions. A transgression, so if you don't know this, it's that deliberate crossing over God's boundary between right and wrong. So these are to be put off and Christ-like deeds are to be put on. So when a put-off is listed in Scripture, as we mentioned, there is an appropriate put-on often in the same passage. So it's not just a put-off and that's it. There's a put-on, the contrary, so that this is what you're going to focus on. Um, So we are to receive with meekness the implanted word there. So this humble acceptance uh, is contrasted with that quick speech and anger, uh, as verse 19 mentions. So James is not asking believers to be converted here. Um, Because that's already happened. He's already speaking to believers. Uh, To accept the planted word, uh, speaks here, accepts the law abiding and also to seek to live by them. So this word is planted within us. It becomes part of our being. Uh, Soil, as you know, uh, which is... um, you know, the, the word that must be planted must be receptive in order to grow. So the soil of our hearts, for that seed to grow, the heart needs to be receptive. So to make a, the soil receptive, we must give up any impurities in life, uh, the attitudes that are not pleasing to the Lord. So that's one way to, to cultivate a receptive heart. Uh, so the exchange that James describes here, uh, we be removing the, the sin covering our life, accepting what has been planted from within, helps us to understand several ways in which God works. So God's word, as you know, directly identifying and removing the things that are unacceptable in our life. 
And we all have areas to different degrees of things that need to be removed. But his word and his spirit also works inside of us. So our spiritual growth happens on the inside out. Uh, like a wound. Um, must have the surface clean and kept clean uh, until the scab forms. But the healing occurs from underneath. That's where you feel that itchiness or tingleness. It starts to come, that's coming from within, but the scab needs to be uh, clean. So this verse is describing both aspects of this process that's applied to our spiritual life. So the purity of God's word will preserve us in an impure age, the, the age that we're living in right now. Now, in order for us to receive the word, we need to have a prepared heart, as we see in verse 21. So James saw the heart as the kind of this garden. And left to itself, as you know, if you leave your garden to yourself, all you're going to get is weeds, right? That's what's going to happen. So he urged us to pull out the weeds and prepare the heart for the implanted word. So it's foolish to try to receive God's word in an unprepared heart. So we need to have that prepared heart. How do we have uh, the, the prepared, the, the soil of our hearts for God's word? Well, number one, you uh, confess your sins and asking God for forgiveness. That is the foundation for all of us. You know, that kind of removes some of the, the hindrances there. Uh, again, meditating on the word, thinking upon it, uh, thinking upon God's love and his grace, asking him to plow up the hardness uh, of our hearts, so the things that are not pleasing to him, as it says in the Old Testament in Jeremiah, to break up the foul ground, if you will. And then uh, we got to have the, the attitude of humility, meekness, and teachableness. So when you receive the word of God with meekness, here's the thing, you're going to accept it. You're not going to argue with it. You're not going to, uh, you know, explain or uh, excuse away your actions and behavior. You're going to honor it as the word of God. Um, and, and, and don't try to twist things or to conform it to your thinking. This is what the word says. It's the final authority. If we don't receive the uh, implanted word, then we're deceiving ourselves. Uh, and, and there's a lot of Christians that like to argue various points of view, uh, only fooling themselves. Uh, they, they're thinking their discussions are promoting spiritual growth, but in reality, it's, it's often just cultivating weeds because it's not based on the Word of God. So God's Word, as we said, is the final authority, not my opinion or anyone else's opinion. God's Word is true. It's the final authority. And it needs to become a permanent part of us, guiding us every single day. So the implanted word becomes a part of us. We absorb the characteristics taught in the word and then expressed in how we live it out. So the trials, the temptation cannot defeat us if we're applying God's word in our life. And then we see the final section here, verse 22. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer. He is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. He's like a, observing his face, goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks to the perfect law of liberty and continues in it is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. So simply hearing or reading uh, or even studying God's word doesn't profit us if we don't do what it says. As, as important as it is to hear it and listen to it, you've got to do it. You've got to apply it. You've got to live it out. So we learn God's word, not just uh, know it. We've got to do it and apply it. So our obedience, listen, is the measure of our love for the Lord. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey me. It's that simple. So if you love the Lord, you're going to obey him. You're going to obey what the word says. Uh, and again, that last phrase there in verse 22, and so deceive yourselves. This is the second time he's used the word deception uh, that he warns against. In verse 16, it uh, tells us not to be deceptive of God's character. Uh, here, James is concerned that we not be deceived about the character of God's word. Uh, so we're not to engage in passive listening, uh, but rather an active attentiveness uh, that leads to action. Uh, so deceiving, as you know, is it's a verb uh, used uh, throughout the New Testament that means to cheat or to deceive by false reasoning. So deception comes from thinking that they have done all that they knew necessary uh, just by listening to the word, which isn't true. You've got to do it. So if you're only listening, you're going to deceive yourself and not being a doer of the word. So to be a doer of the word. So knowledge, you see, is a prelude to action. So it's important to hear it, but... but we need the action behind it. 
So God's word can only grow in the soil of obedience. So in order for a message or a sermon or a teaching or whatever to make a difference in a person's life, it's got to enter the heart, into the mind, affecting their life. So it's important to hear God's word, but much more important to obey it. So we can measure the effectiveness of our Bible study time by the effects it has on our attitudes and our behavior. So that's where we want to see the growth and the change in all of us. Did we put into action what we have studied, what we have learned? Uh, as Jesus says, you know, blessed rather those who hear God's word and obey it. So James tells us that we hear, you know, just like what Jesus says, and, and, and probably James heard Jesus many times talk about obedience so oftentimes. So James is emphasizing the importance of actions as a part of their faith. Later on, he's going to discuss uh, this topic later, uh, in much greater lengths in chapter 2. So now we can begin to examine how we might fall under uh, James's concern. How often do we merely hear the word of God with actually no intention of obeying it and doing what it tells us to do? So if our actions of service are only self-serving and our concern is only for those closest to us, then we're not being obedient to uh, the word. So it's not enough to hear the word, as we said, we got to do it. And many people have mistaken the idea of hearing a good sermon or even a Bible study, for that matter, what makes them grow and to get God's blessing. But it's not the hearing, it's the doing that makes all the difference. Um, and so a lot of Christians, again, they mark their Bibles, but their Bibles are not marking them. So we've got to be receptive to it. Verse 23 goes on to say, He's like a man observing his natural face in the mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. So the, the, the only one who hears God's words without doing it is the same sense and, sense and stability as a man who goes to the mirror and then immediately forgets what they saw. You know, uh, the, the information he, he received wasn't going to do any good in his life. Uh, so the Greek the way it's translated observing here means careful study, scrutiny. Uh, so it's kind of referring to that careful study and scrutiny of God's word. Uh, and, and as you know, the main purpose of owning a mirror so you can see yourself to make yourself look as clean and neat as possible. So as we look into the mirror of God's word, we see ourselves as who we really are. So James mentions several mistakes people make as they look into the mirror. First, they merely glance at it, uh, glance at themselves. Uh, they don't carefully study themselves as they read the Word. So many, again, sincere believers read a chapter or some parts of the Bible each day uh, only as a religious exercise. I, I read the Bible and that's it, but it didn't really comprehend. And their conscience, again, would bother them if they wouldn't have their or do their Bible reading, right? You feel guilty, I didn't do it. You know, when actually their conscience would bother them because, uh, and should conscience them, because they didn't listen carefully to it and obey, uh, and obey it to their, their lives. So that superficial reading would never reveal the deepest need. So it's that difference between kind of a photo versus an x-ray image that takes place. We're looking for the x-ray image so we can really see who we really are. The second mistake is they forgot what they see. So if they're looking deeply enough into their hearts, they'll see uh, something that's unforgettable. I need to change this. My attitude is not right here. Uh, and then the third mistake is they fail to obey what the Word tells them to do. Uh, they think that hearing is the same as doing, uh, and it's not. So we Christians, again, enjoy uh, substituting reading for doing, or even talking for doing. Uh, so if we're going to use God's mirror uh, profitably, uh, then we must gaze into it carefully with the intent of making a change in our life, not just quick glances. So we've got to examine our hearts and our lives in the light of God's word. No one can do that for you. Only you can do it and you can be serious about it. Lord, give me that heart. For that, And that could be a prayer of yours uh, each and every day. Help me to change. Help me to be more like you. Give me a hunger and thirst for your word and for righteousness, a hatred for evil. Make my heart break for the things that break your heart. You know, so we can always have that as part of our prayer. After seeing ourselves, we must always remember, here we are, and this is what God says, and here's what we must do about it. Uh, so the blessing comes when you do the word, not just in reading it. Reading it's great. It's good information, but you've got to do it. That's where you're going to be blessed. So the emphasis is in the practice of the word. 
And uh, the, the word, again, does have cleansing power in our lives. Uh, so important for us to be a doer of it. Verse 25 goes on to say, But he who looks to the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, this one will be blessed in what he does. So he who looks to the perfect law of liberty. So in the, the, the language in the Greek, uh, the word looks into speaks of a penetrating examination. So that person will even kind of kind of bend over to take a closer look at it. Uh, so he's stressing the doing part. Uh, and and it's not the neglecting of the study part or the reading part, uh, but you're looking more intently at it. Uh, so this man looks with serious attention and then makes God's law his chosen lifestyle and becomes a passion and priority in their life. The perfect law of liberty, this is a wonderful way to describe uh, the word of God. The new covenant, as you know, God reveals us the law. And again, the new covenant, that relationship that we have with the Lord. But it's the law of liberty written uh, in our transformed heart by the Spirit of God. So the perfect law of liberty is perfect because it's God's law. God's word is perfect. It cannot be improved upon. Uh, it works uh, toward a given end, to equip us, uh, to complete us, to perfect us. That's part of the intended pur uh, purpose as well. So the giving, the law gives freedom uh, because it's the only obeying the law of God that true freedom can be found. As Jesus says in John chapter 8, uh, verse 31 and 32, when Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples in indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Knowing the truth comes from the word. That's what's going to set you free. Obeying our emotions and giving in to our desires brings bondage. But in accepting God's word and his will brings us freedom in our life. Uh, we're free to obey. Now, this perfect law is also used elsewhere, as we'll see later on in chapter 2, called the royal law. Uh, so it's the foundational principle of uh, the Lord. As Jesus says, you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, this, and the second great commandment is uh, to love your neighbor as yourself. For all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. <coughs> That's the perfect law. That's the law of liberty. That's the royal law. Uh, the perfect law calls us to love God unconditionally and to love others uh, as uh, ourselves. So this law with uh, almost uh, unlimited applications to it. So it kind of seems ironic that a law would give us freedom. Um, but God's law points out sin in us and gives us the opportunity to ask God for forgiveness. And as Christians, we are saved by God's grace, and salvation frees us from sin's control. So as believers, we're free to live as God created us to live. And of course, this doesn't mean that we're free to do as we please, uh, but we're free to obey the Lord. That's where that freedom comes in. So this one will be blessed in what he does. Uh, so they're blessed because they looked intently at God's word. They continue to do and apply God's word. They don't forget what they have heard or what they have seen in the word. They act on it, uh, letting it make a difference in their life and reap the benefits having done what God had required them to do. So our first priority, again, as believers is to receive the word. Then we must practice and apply the word. Next week, we'll talk about another priority and responsibility, and that is to share the word uh, with missions and evangelism, compassion, and other things like that. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for your word. We pray that you continue to mold us and shape us to be the men and women you've called us to be. We pray that we be doers of your word, not just hearers only. The areas in our life that are not pleasing to you, areas that we need to get right with you, areas that we need to uh, deal with, Lord, that you give us the grace, the strength uh, to deal with them. I pray, Lord, that you would just give us the, the strength uh, each and every day uh, as we face this evil and dark world. May we all uh, take heed to what your word says. May we uh, flee temptation, uh, resist temptation. May we endure temptation. And may we just pray for that escape. Whatever we're facing, whatever trial or difficulty, we're going to trust you and stay close to you. I pray you bless my brothers and sisters here, that you'd fill them with your spirit, lead them, guide them, direct them, strengthen them, those who need healing, those who need a, a fresh word for you, whatever it is, Lord, that you minister to every heart here. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.